Good morning, BNC family. So good to have you again here this morning. Uh, a couple of things that we just want to bring to your attention. Um, an email just went out the other day about ver uh, Vacation Bible School. Um, we kind of said that things are probably going to look a little bit different this year, and it is. It's going online. And so please make sure you uh, look at your email and, and uh, uh, touch base with Karen. Um, this is going to still be an all hands on deck experience. And so we need everybody's help with this. Um, we've never done anything quite like this before. So um, we are still uh, in the business of, of uh, winning people over for Christ and we want to start with the kids this summer. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us to connect with our community in a time that, you know, people are just looking for, you know, uh, relationships and, and just, you know, getting back to whatever life looks like uh, beyond this. And so this is going to be an awesome opportunity for us to reach uh, the kids in this community, and we need your help. So please uh, get in touch with Karen. Any questions that you have, sign up um, right now. Um, and uh, let us know uh, that you're going to be able to help, and we'd certainly appreciate that. Likewise, Mission Trip Birdsboro, those applications are going to be due within the next week, um, not only just for ap uh, applications for assistance, but if you're planning to volunteer. Um, those projects are going to be mostly outside, probably all outside this year, and so um, still planning uh, for that event, and we want to try to encourage as many of our uh, people from BNC uh, to get involved uh, with that. Um, kids camp is still uh, on plan uh, for going forward, and so parents, if your kids are interested in going, uh, they need to see Miss Karen and let her know uh, that they're planning to do that, and we'll get more information out on that as well. Uh, we've got a meal train going on for the Grabowskis family, so uh, help there if you can. In small groups, uh, we just can't emphasize that enough, how important that is uh, to get connected uh, on a regular basis. One of the small groups or uh, small group opportunities is being offered by Celebrate Recovery on a couple different nights of the week. Uh, again, pay attention uh, to your email as far as when those opportunities are. Uh, there's a women's open share on Thursdays and another one on Fridays at 7 p.m. And so if you have any questions about that, I'd encourage you to reach out to Pastor Scott. Um, if you're uh, you know, having a hard time getting connected uh, or whatever the case is. Finally, uh, make sure you let us know if you have any prayer requests or anything that we can help, uh, uh, help you with, uh, uh, pray for specifically. Uh, we're going to encourage you to reach out and, uh, and share that with us. Um, and that way we can pray and continue to lift you, you up. Uh, so glad again to have you here. Let's worship together. God bless you. Well, moms, today is your day. It's a day to say thank you for loving us, caring for us, and guiding us. It's a day to recognize all you do and all you are to us, your perfect, wonderful, amazing children. Thanks for all the early mornings and for taking care of the things we take for granted. Thanks for never giving up on us, even when we stress you out. Thanks for making sure we have what we need and for giving us your heart even when you're sick and tired. Thanks for working hard even when we're a handful and for loving us unconditionally when our attitude is anything but lovable. You're our everything, Mom, and we'd be a mess without you. Today, we thank God for the wonderful gift of you. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning, BNC. We're so excited that you're here with us worshiping. Well, you're not, but you are. You're in your homes, uh, you're hopefully comfy, and you're ready to worship with us. So let's do something a little different. Why don't you get up off the couch this morning? Why don't you join with us as we worship our risen Savior?
Let's go into prayer. Father, we we love you. And we ask, Lord, that your spirit would just pour out upon us. Lord, you you chase us down like that one. And you leave the 99 behind. That's crazy. That is reckless. But that's the love that you show us. A love that doesn't make sense, that the world just can't understand. And the world's crazy right now. 
We don't understand a lot, but we understand one thing, that you're still on the throne and you're never leaving. No matter who's the president, who's the governor, no matter what's going on, you are still in control. So Lord, we know that you're the way maker that's going to go in to our community and all that's going on and all the things that we're struggling with. Isolation and loneliness, depression, anxiety. And you calm our nerves. And you bring peace into our lives. Because that is who you are. That's who you've always been. From the wedding at Cana to, <laughs> to being on the sea. And telling the sea to just be calm. That's who you are. And that's who you're telling us to, right now. You are telling us to be calm, be still, and wait. Because something new is going to happen. We know it. We see it. And we're anxious for it. But Lord, may we not see too far ahead. May we not go before you, Lord. Would you lead us and guide us? Walk with us. May we walk with you. Lord, for those that are battling illness, for those that are battling this disease, we pray your name over it. Because Father, at the end of the day, you are still the healer. You are the great physician. And we trust in you. Man, you are a way maker who knows how to just... <laughs> You split a Red Sea and built a highway right through it. So why should we doubt you now? So Lord, be with us this morning. May as we enter into a new week, Father, may we have fresh eyes for the things going on around us, for the people that are disconnected. May we in this time connect with each other even more. But more than anything, may we connect with you more. Being in your word, hearing your, hearing your voice, taking in the music that your people have produced that glorify your name. God, we just love you. And I don't think there's enough ways we could say it. But the celebration that we will have when we get to be together again physically will be not even a small microcosm of the celebration of when we get to heaven. When we enter into the gates and you say, good job. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And we'll be in awe of all that we see. Lord, we just love you. Guide and strengthen us this week. Equip us for this new normal. But may it not be a new normal with you. May it be something different with you. May we change with you and change the world around us in your name, in Jesus Christ, holy and beautiful. The name that put sin to death and etched our names in the book of life. Amen. BNC, we love you. Pastor Scott's coming up next. Today is a day of honor for moms. For every mother in every stage of life, today is a day of honor. We honor moms of infants and little ones. May God bless you with patience, kindness, and perseverance. And may you believe that your never-ending job will help bring true life to the generations that follow. We honor moms of teenagers. May God give you grace upon grace, and may you travel this uncertain journey together with them as they transition from child to adult. We honor women who are trying to have children, but who are not yet able. It took courage and resolve to come to church today. May God gently remind you that He has not forgotten you 
and may you become newly inspired to keep your eyes fixed on the light of his gaze. We honor grandmothers today. May God give you the grace to see the good that you provided to your own children. And may you help inspire your grandkids to follow Jesus with every step they take. And finally, we honor moms who have lost children prematurely. May God be your strength and comfort on a day like today. And may you rise stronger than ever to be a blessing to others. For those we mentioned and for the many unidentified moms that we didn't, God has always used a mother's love and strength to make known his own love and strength. In your best moments and in your imperfections, the glory of God is shining through you. Happy Mother's Day. Hey, good morning, Birdsboro. Thanks for uh, thanks for checking us out online this morning, wherever you're watching us. If it's on uh, Facebook or YouTube, we're glad you're uh, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're a part of of our church from your couch uh, that we've opened up a, a new campus wherever it is you live, and, and we're glad to do that. So so thanks for checking us out. Um, you know, um, as I've said every week, we're getting a little better each week. We're we're trying new things, and so um, you know, this week we've got some digital connection cards that we're going to be sharing over there on the sideline. We might have already shared it. We'll probably share it again, and we've also got a digital prayer card. I know that's one thing that we've really missed uh, is being able to fill out a prayer card every week and then and then turn it into the offering thing and, and then you know add it to our prayer team. Uh, that, that, that's been something we've missed and we figured out a way to do that digitally. And so we're going to be sharing a prayer card. And just If you would, just take a few minutes. If you've got a prayer request, if you've got a praise, if you just got something you'd love to share, we'd love to you know come alongside you and, and pray with regards to that. So so uh, you know click that link we send and then uh, you know fill it out and just hit submit and then we'll get that information and someone will follow up with you to uh, let you know that for sure we did get it and, and let you know that's been added to the prayer thing. So, so again, thanks for doing that. Take advantage of those things. We're trying a little bit, um, getting a little better and let us know where you are, uh, where you're watching from, how many are with you. If this is your first time, then, you know, welcome. Uh, it's, it's good to, it's good to be seen, um, by you, um, uh, at, at, at BNC, uh, wherever you happen to be, but we're glad you're here to be a part of it. So, so last week we, we wrapped up our conflict series and I had intended to begin a new series this week where we would look not at the conflict that we have with others, but the conflict that we have within ourselves, the things that we're unhappy about, about ourselves, the things that we would change uh, if we could, the things that we've tried to change that we could, not so much um, like New Year's resolutions, but I wish I didn't do this and I wish I could stop doing this. And so, um, and, and looking at changing the things that hold us back um, from who we want to be and, and maybe who it is that, that God intends us to be. Uh, but, but given last year, uh, I began a new series on Mother's Day and we talked about pain and suffering. I figured I'd be in trouble if I went too negative again this year for Mother's Day. So, so instead, we're going to try and celebrate our mothers and, and really women in general, not just moms, by looking at a couple of biblical mothers. Uh, because the world would be a, a terrible place, an unhappy place without the influence of moms and women in our lives. And, and I love moms. I'm the son of one, the husband of another. And I have spent most of my entire life with moms, almost all of my entire life with moms. In fact, it has been a steady constant in my life that some mom has been telling me what to do throughout my entire life. And so I'm very accustomed to it at this point. But but today isn't specifically about moms because because was that isn't specifically for moms. Um, as with every biblical hero, there's insight to be gained for anyone and everyone when we look to scriptures and, and see how God's people reacted and influenced the world that was around them. And so we're going to start with the very first time that woman takes the the stage in the Bible. And, and this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter two. And it's no doubt a passage that you're familiar with. And it's also one that, that some people, many people, some people take issue with. And it says this Genesis two eighteen. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So what God does is, is so this is what God wants to do. Man isn't good, isn't good to be alone. So I'm going to find him a helper that's going to be suitable for him. And so what God does is he creates every animal and then he parades them in front of Adam so that Adam can give it a name. And then once he's done, he finds that none of those things are suitable helpers. None of those things are what Adam needs to really come alongside him. And then it goes down into verse 21. It says this, verse 21 and 22. So the 
Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. The end of verse 22, he made into a woman. And you, you'll often hear preachers, don't, don't, don't turn off just yet in case you think you, you think you know where this is going. But you'll often hear a lot of people stress that God created Eve to be a helpmate. Um, and that's why women should listen to men. And, 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 and that the role of women, the only role of women is just to be there to help men. And, and this is where many people take issue. This is the beginning of where a lot of people have some problems with things that the Bible says. And that this first description of a woman, when they first come on the screen, uh, on the scene, they're talked about as being a suitable helper for man. And it's so condescending to be thought of as a helper. But that's not necessarily true to the text. And, and I think that attitude that we've carried into that represents a misunderstanding of this text in particular. And in fact, all of scripture or a lot of scripture. Because the word helper is the Hebrew word azer. And yes, and it, it literally does mean helper. That is what the word literally means, um, which is again what many people take issue with when you couple that with Ephesians 5, the first uh, 22 through 24. But, but I hope as we get a little more in depth look at it today, at what this word is, and then maybe at some point later on, the rest of Ephesians 5, you'll have a different perspective on what that word helper means. Because that word azer, is repeated about 20 times throughout the Old Testament, and it's often used to describe God. One of those times it says this, Psalms 33, 20 says this, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And so it's a title. It's a role that describes God and his place of influence in the world. And so, and so man and women are created in God's image, but then woman is in fact given the same role that God himself takes to be this helper, to be this, this help and our shield. And it's, so it's used to describe God and that is not a position of subjugation. And that's what Eve was for Adam. Eve was a suitable a suitable help for Adam. That means that she could rise to whatever the occasion was. She could rise to whatever level of help that Adam needed for whatever situation they were facing. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not, and I don't believe that the whole of Scripture says this either. We're elevating women or anyone to this godlike status. But I do believe that the idea of being a help has been greatly degraded from it, what it was that God intended it to be. I think a more accurate description of what God intended or what God created Eve to do than help is the word empower. Women have a great ability to empower and inspire others to rise above where they are. A woman doesn't have to be married to be an empowerer. She doesn't have to be a mother to be an empowerer. Um, I don't think that's a word, but I've made it up for this. Uh, she's an empowerer to other women, sometimes to children, sometimes to situations, sometimes to the church, and sometimes to the kingdom of God at large. And so with that in mind, with this idea that this helper is an, is an empowerer the same way that God provides help and is a shield. We're going to switch gears and jump ahead to the book of Judges and look at one woman who is an empowerer, who is a helper, who is an azer to the people that are around her. And, and, and what's going on in the book of Judges, this is a time when Israel is going through this cycle, this, uh, the, 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 repeating the same things over again, where there's this, there's this disobedience, there's this enslavement, they cry out, God delivers them, and then they go through this period of obedience, and then disobedience starts the cycle all over again. And they go through this numerous times throughout the book of, 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 of Judges. And there's this recurring phase that happens over and over again at each at the beginning of each phase and cycle. And it says, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And that's exactly how chapter four begins. Chapter four, verse one says this, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud had died. And so what has happened is they've turned their back on God and then they filled that spiritual void that was created in their lives when they turned away from God with these new gods, with whatever was current for the day, with whatever the trend was, with whatever the, the, the people around them worshipped. Uh, they, they fill it all with that stuff. And, and that's not too far from what we experience today. We find ourselves distraught over one thing or another. And then we, uh, so many people will find their way to church and, and to, to get things back in order because in some regards it, it, it's a place for healing. It's a place for restoration. 
but then, but then they'll disappear once things start to go well, once they think that they've got it all under control. And then, and then what happens is they inevitably just start that cycle all over again. As new or as current or fresh or relevant as we think that we are, we're really just rehashing the same thing that the people of God have done throughout the entire time of being the people of God. And, and what happens when they do that, when we run through this cycle, is it always leads to the same place. It always leads to being chastised, to being disciplined, to this uh, place of being um, enslaved um, as God's people. And Judges 4.2 says this, And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, the commander of his army, of his army was Sisera. And so when Israel rebelled against God, he responded by giving them over to, the enemy, to their enemies as their, as their punishment. God abandoned them to the life that they chose. He allowed them to, to make a decision, and then he honored the decision that they've made. But he still stood back just far enough to be able to hear and then be able to step in when they began to really cry out again. And, and, then, and they paid a terrible price for their rebellion over and over and over and over again. They pay this terrible price for their rebellion. And Judges 5, 6 says this, they were literally driven from their highways and homes, driven from their homes. Now that may sound desirable right now. We might like for someone to show up and tell us to get out of our homes. We would love that maybe. But for the Israelites, for what's going on here in the book of Judges, this was not desirable. They were driven from the things that they owned. They were driven from the places that they inhabited and that they loved. And they had become these further enslaved people. But when we choose our ways over his, over God's ways, we then make ourselves at the mercy of the enemy and we open ourselves to that chastisement. Uh, We can avoid this by remembering what grace has done. We can avoid this by remembering God is there just beyond the distance, ready to reach out when we would truly cry out to him and and confess the sin when it appears in our lives. But, But God allows this discipline to happen. Sometimes God allows things to not work out the way that we had intended, or he allows sickness or some other sorrows to overwhelm us. He allows chaos and this, dis- this disintegration of, of, this, of the things that we hold dear and important. He allows their finances to be thrown into disarray uh, yeah, and, until we can come to the point that we realize that our supply only comes from him. And go. God allows us to go through the consequences of what it is that we've sown. He allows us to make that choice, to make our bed and then lie in it, but he's ready to... Bring deliverance if we would truly cry back out. But but here's where they, and this is where we come back in the midst of this chastisement. Judges 4.3 says this. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. And so Israel was was oppressed by this man Jabin and his and his armies for the for 20 years. And as far as Israel the Israelites were concerned, the Canaanites were undefeatable. They possessed a powerful army with 900 chariots of iron and and they, this would have been a, a formidable foe, a powerful fighting force in those days. This would have been like coming to a, you know, a, a battle against fighters and tanks with just spears. But the people of Israel didn't even have spears. According to Judges 5.8, it says the Israelites possessed no weapons. They had none of these things. And so they completely lived as a conquered and defeated people. But they called on the Lord and he heard them. Most people today call on God so that he will deliver them from their problems, which is what the Israelites do here, but they fail to deal with the root of their sin. And again, that's no different from what you and I do. That's no different than what we do nowadays. We want deliverance from the problem, but we don't want God to deal with the sin that's down. That's, that's the root of all of those things. If we really want to be delivered from the oppressive effects of evil and, and the harshness of chastisement, then we have to honestly deal with the sin that comes into our lives. Our aim should not be to just escape our problems, but to be found pleasing to the Lord. But nonetheless, that's what the Israelites do. They, they seek an escape and that's what they receive. They want God to deliver them from the present situation and God grants them that. Uh, but they're doomed to repeat the cycle again because they don't deal with the root issue. And then in verse 4 of, of Judges chapter 4, verse 4, we get to the heroine of the story. We get to where we were getting to. Verse chapter 4, verse 4. Now Deborah 
a prophetess, the wife of Lepidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And we're told that, that Deborah is a wife, we're given her husband's name, but there is no mention of her having children. But she will nonetheless, in the, ne in the next chapter, be referred to as a mother of Israel. Deborah is the only woman to be a judge or king of Israel, but she was also she was also a prophetess. And, and so for her to be a judge was a very high and rare compliment during a, a patriarchal time when women were maybe at best ignored, but certainly not used in these instances. But there are so many ways that women and men, that anyone used to define themselves or, or we define one another, whether it be external beauty or wealth or accomplishments uh, and a num any number of things. But the most important quality is realizing, is realizing our role, is realizing the role of importance of being the help, the azer that God created us to be, the help of God to all of mankind. It has less to do with the external things that we're able to get a hold of and more to do with what's found inside. And so as an azer, as, an, as a helper, these are the things that we should do. One is to know the word of God and then train others to know it as well. As a prophetess, Deborah's job was to first listen to God, to, to be in this communion with him, in this communication with him, to listen to what God said, and then communicate what it is that God had revealed to her to the appropriate people, to the people that needed to hear it. And this is not an occasional practice. This isn't something that can be done every now and then or just or when, when I need to have something, when I feel like I'm... Uh, disconnected a little bit. It's a constant ongoing thing. Um, it's, it, for her, it was the habit of her life. It would have affected every other area. Her, her conversations, her character, her conduct are all rooted in the word of God, are all rooted in his words that he would give to her. And, and all that she influences, everything that she does is a reflection of being this prophetess, of being this, this voice, this, this mouth of God. And the second one is, as an Azer, learn to trust God for every need. Because she's a praying reader, Reading and, and meditating on the scriptures, she comes to know and trust in the things that God says. She believes that he's going to come through in the places he says that he's going to come through. She's confident that God will meet her needs, whether they be physical, material, emotional, whatever they are. She's sure that if God has told her to do it, he'll meet the needs to do it through. But Deborah is also a judge. And verse chapter four, verse five says this. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. And so Deborah's a judge raised up by God for such a time and task as this to issue judgments and settle disputes. She's intentionally brought up to be the leader, to be the mother, to be this, this female role model, to be this heroine of the story at this specific time in the life of Israel. As judge, she watched over Israel. She was in charge of its well-being. In, in another piece of scripture, the, the word that's used to describe another word used to describe women is safa. And it's a very simple, it's a very meaningful, it's a very descriptive word. And, and it gives this idea of like on a ship that if you're up in a crow's nest at the highest point of the ship and, 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 and you're working with a telescope or you're the lookout, you're the one that kind of leans over the edge, peers into the distance and, and to say, hey, there's danger coming up here to the left. There's danger here to the right or whatever else it happens to be. They're, they're constantly waiting. They're constantly on guard. They're constantly watching and straining to, to, to catch everything that's on the horizon and around them so that they can and de detect any sign of danger. That's what Safa is. Is, 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 this, is this peering, is this looking out. And it's the same word is used to describe the act of covering or overlaying something to protect it. Think about hens sitting on their eggs or covering her chicks. Uh, and so her role as the judge of Israel is she strains to see in the distance. She looks for the things that are causing them problems. She looks for the things that can be detrimental to them. And then she, so she's watching for any signs of threat. And then she also participates in the protection of the people to cover them as they need to be covered to blanket them with the cover with the prayers of uh, with the prayers to God to to uh, make sure that they're cared for and protected and so and it's this, so as a judge she's the protector as the prophetess she's one who hears the word of God and it was no doubt this dual capacity that she summons the captain of the army Barak verses chapter four verses six and seven she sent and summoned Barak the son of Abinoam from Kadesh Naphtali and said to him has not the Lord the 
the God of Israel commanded you, go gather your men at Sabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. That's Judges 4, 6, 7. And can, can you hear what she's saying? Uh, the words that she's using right at the beginning there? She says, has not the Lord commanded you? That may sound a little bit different from you, the way it's coming from her. You may hear it, you've probably heard it as, didn't you say, or didn't I already tell you once before? And I'm going to leave it at that. You make whatever inflections you'd like to make. But then judge, in Judges 4, 8 through 9, uh, Barak responds to her and he says to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you're going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And so then the next thing, as an Azer, as a helper, be an encourager. The presence of Deborah brought assurance of God's protection to Barak. Because she was there, he knew that he was going to be safe. Because she was a part of what was going on, he knew that God was going to take care of them. He knew that he was doing something that God was sending him to do. He was not as spiritually mature as her and he and, and succumbed to her leadership. But she doesn't belittle him in the middle of it. She encourages him and she says, I will go with you because that's what you've asked. I will go with you. But no, that someone else will have, will have the glory. Even if she has little to share, to be an encourager, even if you have little to share, she willingly offers it. Her desire is to offer words that build, build up rather than tears down. That's what we should have as encouragers, to build people up rather than to tear them down. The next one, as an Azer, as a helper, be persistent. When something needs to be accomplished, she knows. That we're supposed to overtake the Canaanites here. We're supposed to overrun them and drive them out. When something needs to be accomplished, she knows what's required and keeps working until it's finished. Instead of waiting for someone else to do it, she jumps in to complete the task. She calls in Brock and says, hey, remember, you're supposed to go do this. And he says, I can't unless you go. And she says, absolutely, I will be a part of what you're doing. As an Azer, as the helper, be a servant. This is a quality we should all have as followers of Jesus because that's what he was. He was a servant. A woman with a servant attitude doesn't live for herself. A man with a servant attitude doesn't live for himself, but lives for others. They serve others in a variety of ways, remembering that who we follow that when we serve others, we're following in Christ's footsteps. And, 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 and Deborah here doesn't seek a reward or serve only when it's convenient. She says right then and there, I will absolutely go with you into battle. She doesn't do it when she feels like it. She leans into it and says, now's the time to go do it. She understands that when we serve, ultimately what we're doing is serving the Lord. Judges 4.10 says this, and then 14 through 16, and Barak called out to Zebulun and, and Naphtali to Kadesh and 10,000 men went up at his heels and Deborah went up with him. And so they're still greatly outnumbered. 10,000 were men against 900 chariots. That doesn't even give us any of the other numbers that are going on. But Deborah says to Barak, up. For this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? She's reminding him again. Hey, she's encouraging him again. Don't lose heart with what you see in front of you. God has already promised that this is what he will do. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Sabor with the 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots. And all his army fell before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to the uh, Harasheth Hagayim. And all of the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. And so Deborah again leans into that and says, hey, now's the time to do it. She waits for the proper timing of the Lord. She doesn't strike out on her own and say, I, let's just go do this. She waits until up for this is the day. God had commanded her, today's the day that I want you to go and take over this. And so then once all of this is said and done, she'd already told Barak he's not going to get the glory for this. But once all this is said and done, she writes this elaborate song. Her and Barak write, write this elaborate song, which is Judges chapter 5, which is a, a poetic retelling of what we've experienced in chapter 4. And, and, and what she's doing is she's showing humility. 
and giving all the praise to God. Reads through it. She's not taking the glory for herself. She's not giving the glory to the woman who actually kills the man. She's not giving the glory to Barak and stuff. She reads through it and she gives all the glory, all the praise to God because he's the one that has done the work. He's the one that made it all happen. He's the one that's been behind. They were just instruments of what he did. And so as an as heir, as the helper, we have to show humility. It doesn't matter who gets the job done. It's who gets the credit. For Deborah, it was God. And this text is really clear that everything that occurred in chapters 4 and chapter 5 was 100% dependent upon what God was doing and nothing that, that Deborah or Barak or Jael had done. She practices and lives out this humility. And then here's the, here's the result of this humility that she lives in. Judges 5 verse 31, the very end of it. It says, so may all your enemies perish. May everything that stands against you perish. May everything that has drawn you away and has led you away and has filled you with emptiness. May all of your enemies perish, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. Deborah's actions, what she did, the, the way that she stepped out, this mother of Israel, the way that she encouraged Barak to go and, 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 and today's the day to go and, and fight the battle, brought 40 years of peace for, the, for, the, for all of Israel, 40 years of rest for all of Israel. And then so lastly, as an Azer, as a helper, have great influence. Shape the world through your godly influence. We all have a part in shaping the world that's around us. And what, uh, what an Azer does, what a helper that God has ordained does, is shapes it in a godly way, is shapes it after who he is, and shapes it after his values and what he deems to be appropriate. And so each of us must strive to be this helper. We were created to be this Azer. We were created to be this helper. We were empowered to be this encourager, this empowerer. The Bible never states that every woman should be a child beaver. It never states that every woman should be a wife. It never states that any man should in either race. But it does say that all of us were created to be the helper. This woman specifically created to be the helper. All of us created to be encouragers. All of us created to be empowerers. Uh, all of us created to be the ones who it's impossible to get anything done unless we lean in and we're a part of it as this, as this Azer that God has ordained. It has less to do with biological children and more to do with what's inside of us and how we react to the word and to the world around us. Reading and praying the word of God, trusting and being obedient to him for deliverance, encouraging those that are around us, being persistent to follow after the Lord, even in the, in the, in the midst of dark times, uh, serving others and then influencing them to do, the, to do likewise, to do the same things. For each of us, the message is the same and with, with no apologies to, to or with apologies to Mr. Rogers. Don't just look for the helpers. Be the helpers. Be an Azer. That's what God has called each and every one of us to be from the beginning of creation when he says, here is the woman who's going to fill my role as a helper to man, as a helper to humankind, as a helper to bring people back to me. That's the role that each one of us as believers, that each one of us as followers of Christ has been called to commit to, to be an Azer. We were created for such a time as this. We were placed in these specific moments to have impact and influence on the world that's around us in a way that's meaningful and that is God ordained. Be an Azer to the world around us. Lord, we just thank you for your love, for your grace, for your compassion. Lord, we're, we are so much like the Israelites who live in this cycle of, of failure and then return to you and then obedience and then deliverance or, and, then, and then failure again. Lord, we live in, in that cycle so often in our lives. And, and what you say to us is stop the cycle. What you say to us is, let's deal with the root. Let's deal with the sin. And so, Lord, this morning, help us deal with the sin that's in our lives. Help us to cast those things out. Not just to deal with the effects, Lord, deliver us from the, the punishment of them. But, Lord, deliver us from the sin that causes the punishment. Because, Lord, when we do that, when we're brought into this light relationship with you, then we're able to re fully realize who it is that we're supposed to be. We're able to fully realize the A's there that we're supposed to be to influence the world that's around us. And so Lord, we're thankful that you've given this word, that you've specifically maybe given this task to women at the very beginning to say your job as a helper is not one of subjugation, but one of empowerment and one of leadership. And Lord, we follow the, the, the so many women throughout the Bible that, that fit that mold and that are obedient to who you've called them to be. Lord, Deborah is just one of many, but Lord, 
Lord, we also want to be the one of many. We want to be the ones that are found to be the Azares, to found to be the helpers of God's people, to be the helpers of the world around us, bringing them to peace with you. And so, Lord, use us in those places. Lord, help us to celebrate uh, the, the, the moms, the women, the mothers that are in our lives. But, Lord, help us to find the places to have greater influence in the world around us. Lord, help us to be the Azares. Lord, we love you. Lord, we serve you. Lord, we thank you for who you are and the grace to deliver us and to hear us at each and every moment. In your name we pray. Amen. So thanks for joining us um, online again. It's really great to see all of you. Uh, make sure you come back next week. So we're going to kick off the series next week. Uh, hopefully we've, we've got through Mother's Day now. So I won't offend any women when I start to uh, a kind, of, um, uh, kind of attack who we are as individuals inside. So make sure you're here next week as we kind of declare war on the things that are inside of us that keep us from being who we want to be and more importantly, who it is that God wants us to be. Have a great week, BNC family, and we'll see you next Sunday.